Yuletide greetings and salutations to everybody out there in podcast land. This is the Judo Chop Suey Podcast, and I'm your host, Judo Dave Roman, coming back at you with a special episode, the ultimate showdown of ultimate destiny, the Hifumi Abe versus Yoshiro Amariyama match. This thing was tremendous. It was It was far bigger and far uh, more entertaining than I would have ever suspected. And I wasn't sure what I was going to expect out of this. I'll say this. I expected that there was going to be a golden score. But I did not expect a 20-minute golden score. So uh, let's let's start from the top. (laughs) I actually did not watch the match live like like a dum-dum. I set my alarm to go off at 12.30 p.m. instead of 12.30 a.m. because the match was supposed to start at 1 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time for me, which I believe is about 3 p.m. in Tokyo. And I had already agreed to meet up with, uh, I think, Lance, certainly Lance Wicks, I think Evo Dos Santos, and a few other people on a live stream. But I I, I screwed up the time and... and I slept through the match, so I ended up having to find the stream somewhere else. It ended up being Lance's live stream that was uploaded to YouTube, and thank God for you, sir, because you know what? Uh, the Japanese media, whoever was running the uh, Abe versus Mariyama match, took it down all over YouTube. So there was not a Japanese stream that I could have watched it, but thankfully for you, uh, you, you put it up there, and I really appreciated that. So before I get into the kind of the breakdown and my thoughts on the match, I, I want to get this out of the way first. I thought about maybe doing this toward the end, but I'm going to do it now. I said this on my part one of my interview with Kiyoshi of JudoFan.com. I really feel it felt it should have been Abe the entire time. I, I don't think the single match elimination was the best way to go to decide this outcome. Because there's so many factors involved, like like Kiyoshi said, Mariyama had to travel a great distance to to get to Tokyo, and and for Hifumi Abe, he's been practicing and training right at home in Tokyo, so he didn't. Oops, sorry about that. He didn't have to travel very far to get to the Kodokan. Where whereas for Mariyama, I believe he was had to travel about three hours to get there. So there's that aspect of that. I, I, I think Mariyama w- was at a disadvantage coming into this match uh, just in terms of logistics and such. But here's the other thing w- why I don't think it really should have come down to this. I've been saying, for those of you who have been listening for years, and that's many, many of you, I- I've been saying for a long time that I've never really understood how Mariyama even got into this position where this was even a debate. Because to me... If you look at the results of this Olympic cycle, it should have been Hafumi Abe the entire time. He's won, you, uh, you know, two world championships, eight Grand Slam medals, and and one Grand Prix uh, medal. That's all gold. So so really a total of eleven gold medals in this Olympic cycle uh, on the IJF World Tour, compared to Maruyama, who's won. One world championship, one masters championship, two grand slams, and two grand prix. Those are all gold medals. He's had a smattering of, of silvers and bronzes and, and top finishes, just like Hifumi Abe. But the overall body of work in, uh, was without question in Hifumi Abe's favor. And on the IJF World Tour, Mariyama has only competed 10 times in this Olympic cycle. So to me, it almost seems as if there was some kind of political pressure by powers that be somewhere in the All Japan Judo Federation that wanted Mariyama in there for whatever reason. I, I know Kiyoshi and I kind of debated back and forth on that, but to me, it, it, like I said, it should have been Abe. And a lot of people are saying, well, Mariyama was injured and stuff, but you know what? Across all sports, your best ability is availability. And if you got a guy that's competing far more often than, than the other guy, then and he's found you know two world championships compared to one. I mean, how is that even a debate? But regardless of all of that, here we are, or here we were, I should say, and the match delivered. So first things first, I was really impressed with the presentation of this event. The Kodokan had changed the mat color on that main floor. Now, p- 
please pardon me. I have never been to the Kodokan, so if if that main floor, that competition area has a specific name, I don't know what it is. I, can, I don't remember what floor it's on. I think I've read it's on the seventh floor, but I'm probably wrong about that. So they changed the mats on the floor. They had, it felt like an IJF World Tour presentation. The camera angles, the replays, uh, the commentary, even though it was just in Japanese, but still the excitement, uh, the excitement leading up to the match. It was really interesting, again, because I've never been there. Really interesting for me to see the the, the back areas of the Kodokan, I, like the stairs leading up to that to that level, and it, it was just interesting to see you know Abe and Mariyama in their shoot, for lack of a better term. So they both get up onto the mat. They both bow to each other. Abe forgets to bow to the judges in front. They, <laughs> it was odd seeing uh, Abe in a blue judogi in a Japanese contest at the Kodokan. That's probably a first, but in my opinion, absolutely necessary for the significance of this match. You you can't have what happened uh, here, what happened at the Kodokan Cup just, just a couple of weeks prior. Now, I want to be perfectly clear that I have not re-watched this match, so a lot of this is I'm just spitballing here and going by memory. So for starters, in in my observation, it seemed to me that Hifume Abe had a more specific game plan than Maruyama. And I'm not saying that Maruyama did not have a game plan. I'm just saying that I saw Hifume Abe do things that were very specific and it looked like he was really defending himself against Mariyama's Uchimata. In order for Mariyama to to get that Uchimata, obviously he needs his preferred grip and it just seemed like in terms of the grip fighting and I I'm I'm not an expert in grip fighting but in terms of the grip fighting it looked like Abe had a very detailed very specific way of avoiding getting gripped up in an, in an inferior position. Hey, I mean, and look, that's the game, right? You you need to get uh that that's the whole point of grip fighting is is to ensure that you get your grips and and deny the other person their grips. You don't want to be in a 50-50 situation and, and Abe made sure of that for pretty much 24 minutes of that entire match. So like I said before, the match went into golden score. I was not surprised that that one bit it just went that the four minutes came and went, you know, very quickly, just like I thought. I, I didn't think for a second there would have been a score within those four minutes. So here I am thinking, okay, maybe this is going to last six, seven minutes in the golden score, but it it, it eclipsed it it eclipsed seven minutes. It eclipsed eleven minutes, which was a which is the longest golden score I've ever watched. I can't recall which match that was, but it was a women's match on at a at I believe it a Grand Slam. So they eclipsed the eleven minute mark, and it just kept going and going and going. The attacks were good, and I think the biggest one of the biggest surprises to me after watching this entire match is how much how well I mean they were in such good shape for this match given all of the challenges with with COVID and such and I'm sure, look obviously they're probably training they've been training this entire time but still it's not the same so and these guys look like they could have gone another 20 minutes and that was just so impressive to me because when I was their ages when I was younger in my teens I used to be a competitive distance runner I mean I used to you know, run a mile in about four minutes and 20 seconds. Like I I used to be able to run really fast for, for distance. So I used to have a tank and seeing these guys go, I, I did not have the type of tank that those guys clearly have. It it was just, just blew me away. Like I said, it looked like they could have gone another 20 minutes. Now for the match itself. I mean, it looked like your typical Hifume Abe uh, Yoshiro Maruyama match. It looked like the ones that I've seen before in terms of how the pace was dictated and stuff. Uh, Abe looked like he was all over the place, and I mean that in a good way. Just, just you know, constant pressure, constant attacking. It looked like Maruyama was trying to pick his spots. And and here's something that I want to talk about uh, because I've seen a lot of debate and discussion about this online. 
I thought the officiating was fantastic. I think they did the right thing. They called the match the right way. And truth be told, even though they got an IJF official to, to officiate this match, it would not surprise me at all if the All Japan Judo Federation went to that referee and told her, listen, you, we cannot have a winner by Shido in this thing. And I know there was a few people that I've read online, in particular on Reddit, that, that there's some people out there that feel that a match should be called uh, as fairly as possible regardless of the of the stakes at hand, regardless of the circumstances, and I don't agree with that. I feel that in, in any sport, there are situations and circumstances that, that transcend rules. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, allowing some deliberate Hansoku Make to happen without punishment. I'm not saying that, but... There was a lot of things that both Hifumi Abe and uh, Yoshiro Maruyama got away with in this match. And I was okay with it. There was... I thought Maruyama was a bit too passive at times during this match. I thought Abe was... uh, Had a few grips that were illegal. I saw a couple of instances where where he was grabbing the judogi below the belt. That's a no-no. And by by allowing these athletes to dictate the pace and the tempo of the match and not have referee involvement, we saw a really dazzling display of movement in judo and attacking and defending. It, it was really a beautiful display despite not a single score being uh, scored in, in over 20 minutes. Maruyama had a couple of, of Tomonagi attacks that were just beautiful that I think he would have... He would have gotten anybody else but Abe on that. Now, I completely understand that different fighters are going to create different looking contests and such. But I think by the referee allowing a free-flowing movement and actions and stuff, it created a match. And I think the IGF, after the Olympics, they need to reevaluate the rules again and, and tweak some things so that we get more of this kind of movement in action. I really think the IJF should do a test trial of new rules that would allow for more freedom of movement. So I want to talk a little bit about the final score in this match that ended it and gave Hifumi Abe the victory. Abe and Maruyama were in Kenka Yotsu position. Each had a, a grip on the the lapel area and they're both fishing for the sleeve now Abe gets the outside grip on the sleeve that he wants and immediately attacks with a kosorogari if you want to call it that yeah because he he hooked his his foot around the back of the the leg just to bring himself closer to Maruyama and I took some notes as I was watching just so I can say with with certainty it went kosorogari ouchigari another ouchigari attack Maruyama tries to counter it he knows he's not going to get it. He arches his back to try and avoid the score. And Hifumi Abe gets the Wazari on a curious looking score. Now as many of you know, I have been against anybody using their head to bridge out of a throw. And in this situation, it looked like Maruyama was trying to not get scored on by arching his back and planting his head on the ground. To me, that's a no-no. There are documented rules against those kind of actions. Now, whether or not that was the deciding factor for the score, I'm not sure. But in my mind, I I felt like maybe the referee had seen enough. That was enough to to award a score. And let me say this. I've seen far worse scores on the IGF World Tour. Now, I know some people out there are saying, well, Abe didn't have control because as Maruyama was landing on his head, he had lost his grips and his hands were planted on the ground. I mean, yeah, you're right if you pause it and slow it down, but the referee there in that position doesn't have the benefit of an instant replay right in front of her. And assuming they had instant replay from the judges on on, on the table out on the side, they all came to the conclusion that that was enough. I think given the, the pomp and circumstance... They weren't going to screw this call up. So they must have seen enough in that score where they can comfortably say that Hifumi Abe got the score and earned that victory. And I'm okay with that. I can live with that. I really didn't have a rooting interest in this match per se. I 
I always felt it should have been Hifumi Abe from the get-go, as I said earlier. But that's not because I'm some huge Hifumi Abe fan. I mean, even though I am. But I'm not any more of a fan of his than I am of, of Maruyama. It's just I thought Abe was more deserving. And I think given the call here, it, it was enough. It wasn't ideal. But under the IGF rules and how they score these things and how they how they have rules against arching your back and landing on your head and all this kind of stuff, I think it was I think there was enough there to declare a winner. Now I saw some post fight interviews uh, on Japanese TV, and while I didn't understand a single word that Maruyama was saying, the the expression on his face said it all. And even the expression on Hufumi Abe's face after he stepped off the tatami after winning that match against Maruyama, his expression on his face was he was practically in tears. He just had this look of relief. He was very upset. Uh, not upset in an, in an angry way. Just just a whole flood of emotions over the past year plus of, of this entire debate on who should be representing Japan in the under 66 kilo division. It was just... A sense of overwhelming relief for him. And I think for Maruyama, it was a sense of overwhelming grief. And I tell you what, the the the, the, the All Japan Judo Federation, whoever was manning the cameras, they captured all of that. They captured the human element of this match. And they captured it in a way where language didn't matter. You don't have to be judo you don't have to be a judokan, you don't have to be Japanese to feel for Maruyama. And you don't have to be a judoka and you don't have to be Japanese to appreciate the effort and 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 hard work and everything that went involved, everything that was involved in Hufumi Abe's victory. And, you know, the thing that I feel really badly about for Maruyama uh, outside of missing his chance to go to the Olympics is what kind of pressure and what kind of circumstances is he going to face with his family? I mean, if you guys haven't listened to the interview with that I had with Kiyoshi, I really strongly suggest that you do because if I recall correctly, Kiyoshi was telling me that Mariyama's father didn't talk to him after for, for years after a single loss. I mean, is, is, is dad going to give him the silent treatment again for years and years and years over this? God, I hope not. And it, it's no surprise that Japan has a high uh, suicide rate within their country. Uh, I mean, th- that's according to Kiyoshi, but it doesn't surprise me when you see th- th- there's so much at stake and so much pressure for these athletes. So maybe Maruyama retires here. I-, I really don't know. Does he Does he really have anything left to prove? He's one of the greatest ever in that division. I mean, he has 10 gold, me- or he's got 10 medals total on the IJF World Tour. Most Most athletes don't have anywhere near that amount. So I think he's had a tremendous career. He should be congratulated on that career if he decides to retire. And hopefully things won't be so bad for him at home. I, I, I really feel for the guy. So in closing, I wanted to talk about uh, something really briefly in light of this match. This was really different in the sense that it was a predetermined one versus one matchup that everybody wanted to see. And it's my understanding that as many as 400,000 people were watching the match on YouTube and probably many more within Japan itself. I mean, usually when I watch the IJF World Tour on YouTube, I may see about three or 4,000 people watching the live stream at any given moment. But for, for to have that many people tune in for a single event, that's tremendous. And I really think there is a market... For this kind of one-on-one judo, for but but the stakes have to be there. So, for example, remember back in 2019. I'm sure all of you do. I was really looking forward to the under 81 kilo division in in the World Championships because I was fully expecting a Sagi Muki uh, versus Saeed Molai uh, final, but it didn't end up that way. It ended up being Sagi Muki and Matthias Kasse of Belgium, and while that was a good match. It didn't have the same flair that a Mookie versus Molai match would have had. Now, I don't know how the IGF could possibly come up with one versus one, you know, 1v1 competitions where there's something at stake. Because I don't think throwing a bunch of money out there is going to work. 
I mean, maybe you can have, maybe the IGF can have a separate league in the sense where you've got title holders. So what I mean is that you still have your regular your IJF World Tour schedule, but on top of that, you have maybe an IJF Championship League where each division has a title holder, and they can't lose. They can't lose the belt on a on a Grand Slam or a Grand Prix or a World or a World Championship. They have the belt on special circum at at a, at a special league. I don't know, like the UFC, for example. You earn points and you earn medals on the World Tour, but the league itself. Being the league champion automatically guarantees you a spot on the Olympics as long as you're holding the belt. And maybe each champion can have a manager like Classy Freddie Blassie or or the Mouth of the South Jimmy Hart that's always looking out for you just in case the other guy does something shady during the match. You know what I mean? But my overall point here is that I think the IGF could stand to market their premier athletes and put them in guaranteed premier events. Because for me, I want to see Clarice Agbegnenu and Tina Turstenjak uh, fight as often as possible. I want to see Guram Tushishvili and Teddy Renner fight again. And I want to see Soichi Hashimoto fight Shohei Ono in, in, a, in a match that matters. Now, speaking of matches that matters, it's my understanding that Jessica Kim Clayt and Christina Deguchi are going to have uh, a similar matchup like Abe and Maruyama. So for those that are not aware, Kim Clayt and Deguchi are number one and number two in the under 57 kilo division, and they both represent Team Canada. So as I was saying all this, I decided to go into the Google machine and and do a search on that, and I found the article on judoinside.com. And they are planning to have a best out of three match, which perhaps is a little more fair than than a single match elimination. But I don't know if they're going to have three matches in a row or if they're going to have a single match or a once a day for three days. I'm not quite sure, but in my opinion, this match is just as huge because Canada has a great judo team. And Deguchi is the uh, current world champion. And not only that, both of them have shown tremendous success on the IGF World Tour. And really the only uh, significant difference between the two is that Deguchi has won a world championship and has earned a bronze at the world championships. So I'm looking forward to that one. I'm sure many of you are. But that's not going to happen for quite some time. There has not been a date set for that. But thankfully for me, that's going to be happening uh, relatively close to my time zone so I can be wide awake to watch that one live and and not miss it at all. So that's going to do it for this episode. If you guys want to chime in, uh, shoot me an email and let me know your thoughts on the match. Feel free to do so at judochopsuishow at gmail.com. You can reach out to me on Twitter and on Instagram at La Vida Judoka. And you can also find me on Facebook, uh, look, look up uh, Judo Chop Sui Podcast. I'm not on Facebook as much, especially because of all that election crap and stuff. It just, uh, I mean, I'm on there, but, but probably the best way to reach out to me is via email or on Instagram. Those are probably the platforms. Well, email is not hardly a platform. It's hardly a platform, but Twitter and Instagram are my platforms of choice to kind of keep up on news and, and, and discussion and things like that. So with that, I'm going to end things here. I'm not going to do my typical Gangnam style exit. I'm going to, because this episode is titled The Ultimate Showdown of Ultimate Destiny, I'm going to exit this episode with that song. So with that, I hope you all have a great day. I hope you all have a great rest of the week. Train hard. Stay safe out there. And until next time, I'm out. This is the ultimate.